It was the 70s. I had very long hair, not dissimilar from what I've got now. And um, I, they sat me down in the makeup room and they put a bowl on my head and they cut round my hairline like this. So they removed all my hair, because if you look at me in that film, all the back of my head is shaved and I have a, a, a bowl cut. And Jodie Foster came into the makeup room and I think she sort of sensed that I was feeling the distress of having all my hair cut off. And she started going, well, you know what they do with this hair now once they've cut it all off? And she picked it up and she put it on her top lip and she said, they make the moustaches out of it. <laughs> and so that was kind of like my enduring memory of Learning Bugsy. from the pros, early. Learning from the pros. I yeah. think, and, and at the time I was like, God, Jodie Foster's really tough. And I didn't, but looking back, back on it in retrospect, I think she was just actually trying to be sort of friendly and nice and, and kind of make it easier. And so many other greats you went on to work with. I mean, as a yeah. child actor, you were in massive projects. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Elephant Man, The yeah. Long Good Friday, yeah. uh, Revolution. Mm. I mean, when you're going to work with the likes of Al Pacino and David Lynch, what kind of reaction <laughs> are you getting from the people around you, your schoolmates and, and your parents who are, who are teachers, you know, and yeah. not in the business? So what, what was that like? It was sort of difficult in a way. It sounds a strange thing to say because it's like we should also have such problems to go and work with David Lynch and, mm. uh, and, and you know, uh, be at the Royal Shakespeare Company yeah. and, and be in a Midsummer Night's Dream with Patrick Stewart. But I went to an ordinary comprehensive school and I suppose I was always sort of different. I was, uh, at nine years old, I was babyface from Bugs and Malone. Mm -hmm. And that did separate me out from my peers. Um, but the work is where I really thrived. That mm. was where I kind of understood best who who I was, that's where I seemed to fit in because, because like I say, from six years old, that was you know where I went, that was the most exciting place to be. That, mm. that was always full of creativity, creativity and energy and excitement. Now you had another great ensemble on Press Gang. You are an icon to my media generation of Brits for 43 <laughs> episodes of Spike. This is a teenage newspaper series which inspired me, and as I'm sure you've heard so many others, you know, to go into into journalism uh, right. careers. Yeah, yeah. So uh, how uh, aware of you of the impact that had on the audience? on the career of its creator, Stephen Moffat, mm. and the career of you yourself when you were in your 20s playing a teenager. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, look, it's not unusual that I meet journalists uh, of a certain generation and mm. go, that show sort of lit a fire under me to write. And, and I think that's part of the strength of something like Press Gang. Press Gang was a show about kids running a newspaper. And, and, and what I think is wonderful about that is that it's a creative endeavor to write, to create, to find something, to chase a story, to write a story, to tell a story. That's really what journalism is about, or, or, or particularly that show was about. I mean, it was about the kids that were sort of involved in it, but we're all supposedly teenagers, like you say. And, and, I, and I'm, what I'm immensely proud of is that meeting people in my line of work, as I go around and get interviewed and they say to me, it was that show that inspired me to, to, to do what I do. And I, you know, um, that I can't help but be proud of. But like you say, Stephen Moffat is a, an incredible writer. He wrote every word of all 53 episodes or whatever it was, which is fairly unusual, I think, even by today's standards. Um, and he was a 27 year old school teacher who, who sort of uh, fell into writing for TV. Um, I'm very proud of it. It's part of my history, which is which is great. And I, I like to say I was playing a teenager into my late twenties. That sort of um, uh, maybe played into a little bit of me refusing to grow up. You know, you you, you kind of uh, you know, there's this theory that your early success kind of tends to. Um, uh, kind of halt your development mm -hmm. uh, uh, as an individual and I you know I struck gold at nine uh, with Bugsy Malone I sort of and so I, I didn't I didn't grow up for a long time and and something like press gang was was fine for me to carry on playing a teenager into my late 20s because I I kind of tended to uh, maintain my my child look like outlook on life mm -hmm. you know and it's, it's, but it, it lead, led me to write my first film. And, and what it is is that, you know, as a child actor, you have all the responsibilities of the adult. You have to learn your lines, you have to be on time, you have to understand, you know, you have to work a long day like, like the adults do. So your responsibilities are the same as, as the adult. But then, of course, as you move forward and, and the older you become, you kind of are, are, are locked at a certain stage of development. And as an adult, uh, I found that I didn't function so well as an adult because I was used to 
being on set and, and hmm. things being taken care of for me. So I, I it, it's, it's this very strange uh, kind of crossover point. And that's what led me to write my first film, Wild Bill, which is really about a child who's a man and a man who's still a child, hmm. which was very much based in my own experience. Uh, so yeah, so 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 talk about how you were able to make that because presumably the industry saw you as one thing, and then you had to rather like you have as director now, you had to sort of reinvent yourself and say no, I'm a, an adult actor. Lock, stock, and two smoking barrels was key to that. As well. it, it was that was that was a huge turning point. I, I, I no, I did. I got to a point in my late twenties where that kind of whole childlike, you know, approach to my work and my craft and my career and my just ran out of steam. And then I, of course, I, you know, I had my issues with drugs as well, which is, you know, is fairly predictable. But there's a form of escapism in that, which is, you know, maybe inevitable. Maybe that's what leads down that path. Um, and yeah, I got to my late twenties and I and my life literally fell apart. I, I was going bankrupt. I, I felt like I. Looking back, and I'd squandered these incredible opportunities that that my early career had, had presented to me, and I, and I derailed quite spectacularly. Um, and it was only in my my late twenties I'd been lucky enough to work with Alan Rickman when I was fourteen in the theatre. And he was uh, best man at your wedding, right? He was best man at my wedding because he introduced me to my wife, oh. and he and in do, in doing that. Um, uh, she's a, a theatre director uh, from Lithuania originally and she came over to London to direct uh, and, and kind of get involved in theatre there and Alan kept pushing me to go and do this play in a pub theatre that, you know, um, that was a Goldoni restoration comedy and I was like, I can't do that. <laughs> I had absolutely no belief in my own ability and, and uh, craft at all. But, but I eventually took this job um, after squeezing her knee at an audition and spilling orange juice on her and various other stupid Your things. Your old charm. My old charm. Anyway, I took this job, but it was a huge turning point for me because her approach, you know, she came from the old uh, Soviet school of, it's called Gitas, this, this incredible academy where she, you know, trained as a director. And that sort of reignited a passion and love for acting that I'd not, that I'd kind of lost. And, and it was born of my own innate ability and my talent and my experience, but also rediscovering what that was. And that was the huge turning point. And um, uh, so through my relationship with her, and of course we fell in love and we got married mm -hmm. and, uh, and all, all these, and I, I sort of went back to the beginning as it were. Mm -hmm. and, and then somewhere along the line there, I, I was in Lithuania and Mike Lee uh, came to, uh, to, to, talk in Lithuania he came to give a talk about secrets and lies I think it was and and I was like a massive Mike Lee fan I'd watch Mike Lee with my dad I was a huge Mike Lee fan so I went and sat in the audience like you guys are now with Mike Lee in Lithuania in this tiny little place in Vilnius <laughs> and eventually at the end he said to me I where do I know you from because uh, I was this London guy in the middle of Vilnius it yeah. must have been fairly extraordinary and I said, oh, I'm an actor, actually, Mike, and I, I really love what you do. And, I, and he said, oh, right, OK, OK, write to me, write to me. So I said, OK. So I did, I wrote to him because I, I had this really newfound passion for, for, for acting and I wanted to discover who I, I could become as an adult actor. So I did, I wrote to him and never heard anything. And then one day I suddenly got a call, well, Mike Lee wants to see you. So um, I was like, great. So I went and saw Mike Lee and he had my, my, my letter on his lap. And, um, and he said, I know who you are. And he kind of read my letter and we kind of talked about stuff. Um, anyway, the long and the short of it is he gave me a job. Mm. And, and Mike has a very particular way of working that I was really interested in, you know, this improvisational development. And, you know, that was really exciting to me. And I, and I worked with him for nine months and it drove me mad because I didn't know, <laughs> you know, what was going on half the time. But, but it was very intense and really absorbing. And, uh, and 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 I was cut out of the film completely that he made, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, but that wasn't really the point. The point was that I kind of worked with this incredible, this incredible uh, auteur, I suppose, yeah. he's in his own way. 
Yeah. And, and then the next job I got was 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 Lockstock, and and Lockstock, I saw when I met Guy Ritchie, who was like the antithesis of that. I yeah. uh, was like, yeah, 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 do that again, but just don't move your eyebrows so much. Yes. <laughs> and and uh, which which is equally as valid uh, in terms of a direction, because if you look at everyone in that film, we're all very seriously taking something ridiculous very seriously, yeah. and I think that's what works so brilliantly with Lockstock, you know. Um, but that did that sort of, you know, after a few missteps here and there in my later 20s, people suddenly went, oh, there's Dexter, yeah, there's... Mm. And that slowly again started to, to open things up again for me. So it sounds like your, your confidence was back, uh, helped by your marriage and your mentors, and now you're in a perfect position to take control of your career and write Wild Bill, a, a wonderful film about uh, uh, an ex-convict trying and failing to be a good dad to his, uh, to his, his, his two sons. Mm -hmm. um, of all the experiences you, you've had, why was that the story uh, that you wanted to, to, to tell and how did you end up directing it as well? I, I kind of wanted to write a story about a kid who was a man before his time and a man who had not grown up. So I, of course, took that man and put him in prison and kind of arrested his development there. And I gave the kid a younger brother, so he had to look after his younger brother. So I, I so that spoke to to my own experience, you know, uh, uh, that that uh, adult child and that child adult. Mm -hmm. And then of course I threw them together and um, wrote that script with a friend. And uh, so then I had this script. And it was called Mild Bill originally, mm. until some producer went, we can't call a film Mild Bill. That's, <laughs> no one's going to see Mild Bill. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, but anyway, I, I met this uh, wonderful producer called Sam Tromans, a woman in the UK, and uh, someone introduced me and she said, oh, what do you want to do? And I said, oh, I've got this script. She said, oh, great, let me read it. She said, okay, great, so this is what Mild Bill, and you're going to direct it. And I realised that in that moment that if I said no, that the, probably the opportunity for it to get made was going to disappear. So I said, yeah, 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 that's right. I'm going to direct it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Which I never really had thought about. So anyway, she, she said, uh, uh, here's the opportunity. And I said, yes, which I took. And then she went off and she raised half a million pounds. Nice. And she, yeah, she came back and went, OK, we're good to go. And, I, and then I was like, oh, my, right, OK. OK, I've got to do this then. So then... I had a film to direct and I didn't have much money, but that didn't matter because I'd never directed a film anyway before. So I didn't really know, you know, can I have this? Yes, no, they were the simple answers. And then I went to people like Charlie Creed Miles, who's a fantastic mm -hmm. actor, and Will Poulter, mm -hmm. who had just sort of turned 16 and started to sprout up. Mm -hmm. But I knew what a great actor he was. And then um, Olivia Williams and Andy Serkis and uh, Eddie Marzan was in one version as well. That, that made, but I had all these great actor friends who I could turn to and ask who came and, and came and got involved. Um, and yeah, we made it and I had just the best time. I mean, it, you know, I don't think I realised how hard it was. And that was probably to my advantage because I just was like, it was that thing of being on set again as a kid. I was just absolutely energised and... And it was so much fun, and every day, and even though I didn't know what I was doing, I kind of loved that, and I was mm -hmm. learning. And but but that but that film was a really productive and great experience, and 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 then it got nominated for a BAFTA, mm -hmm. which which was really unexpected, uh, but gratefully received, <laughs> <laughs> um, because. You know, it, it really spoke to my own background, my own working class roots. You know, my grandmother's still alive, lives in Oxton. She's 95, you know. And, and then, of course, with that nomination, uh, although we didn't win, but I still have my lovely certificate at home, um, that meant that I had other opportunities come to me. And, and uh, that was, you know, the start of... of of what leads me to be here today. As yeah. largely does your next film, Sunshine on, on Leith, you yeah. know, which uh, first established you as the uh, the master of the musical movie in a, in, in a way, you know. It's a wonderful, romantic and heartfelt drama about two soldiers uh, coming home, finding love, finding their place in the world, and all played out to the music of the Proclaimers. And uh, you have that fantastic end scene, don't you, in Edinburgh, yeah. with everybody dancing just like 500 miles. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it was... 
you know, a, a big departure from your, your first film in, in terms of genre, if not necessarily in terms of, 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 of drama. Mm. So uh, how did you approach that task? Um, I, I, I think I just approached it like I would any other film. Mm -hmm. I think what I, you know, it was... After all these various different things came uh, to me after Wild Bill, a lot of them were gangster orientated. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I didn't want to just do that. And it, fortunately, my wife was, is now directing opera. Mm -hmm. She has an opera company and she was looking at stuff and she looked at the music and went, do the musical. No one will expect that. Mm -hmm. So I was like, OK, that's probably good advice. And so I did. And it would, it'd been a play, it'd been a show in Dundee and what really spoke to me about it was that it didn't feel like a musical musical. It wasn't, it was very sort of uh, true and honest and real. And speaking to Dahlia about opera and about, you know, the big arias, and we, you know, we sort of discussed about how really their soliloquies, they're, they're, they're the to be or not to be moments. They're when the, 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 the protagonist opens their heart and sings to the audience and you see who they really are and you, and you feel who they really are. And I really love that idea. So I, I grasped that idea and I really approached Sunshine and Leith like it was a drama and not a musical. Mm. And so I, I kept it as domestic in a way as possible for want of a better word. And, and that really worked for it because the songs just came out of a conversation rather than a and here we are with a song. I wanted, to, I wanted to see a musical that I didn't feel was like, okay, and here comes the musical number and everyone dances around. And I wanted them to surprise us. I liked that idea of, of a musical that, that did that. And here was this amazing opportunity to do it. So you're emerging as a director to be noticed even more so with your next film, uh, Eddie the Eagle, starring Taron Egerton and uh, uh, Hugh Jackman. Yeah. Uh, the story of a very British sporting hero, Eddie the Eagle Edwards, the yeah. ski jumper who was useless <laughs> at ski jumping and repeatedly finished last, you know. And now, uh, obviously, you had a big Hollywood star in it with, Holly, uh, with, with Hugh Jackman. Was there any pressure from anyone along the line to sort of change the ending? I know you exactly know, where you're going. Uh, you know, and make it more of a sort of rocky, triumphant... Uh, uh, can he win story. the Olympics? Can, can he mean? win the Olympics yeah. rather than finishing last and almost dying? Yes. <laughs> uh, no. Oh. Uh, <laughs> is, the, is the short... No, because, I mean, I think this was the kind of beauty of Eddie. You know, he's the, the, the uh, perennial... Trier, you know, he, he he stands up to to uh, that scrutiny that he was a real trier, and that was really what was uh, important about that story. And I think what I really engaged with, and um, that it it's not the winning, it's the taking part. And I, you know, I was like Eddie the Eagle, wow, okay. And and Matt Vaughan brought it to me. Now Matt Vaughan was someone I'd worked with on Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. He was the producer on that. I'd known him twenty years. He'd put me in all these films, and invariably kills me in all of his films, which I try not to take personally, but uh, it, yeah, it's, it's relentless, so it's hard to ignore that. But he is a great supporter and a great friend and, and an incredible producer, you know, and to have that opportunity, of course, was, was incredible. And was and, it Matt Vaughan that brought you Taron Edgerton? Yeah, he's mm -hmm. like, I want to do Eddie the Eagle with Taron Edgerton. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? And he was like, no, no, it's, it's, it's interesting. So have a look. So I, so I took that script and I knew it was a great opportunity for me because I, I knew that, you know, I wanted to move forward. Mm. And, um, uh, and, and this was a way of doing that. And so I had to take it very seriously. And then, so then I had to dive into what, what really is compelling about this? What can I say about it? What can I speak to uh, with this story? What's, what's the human element of it? But what I, what I loved about Eddie and the story, and even sitting with Eddie when I met him, was that, and he came with his daughters to meet me. When we sat down, I wanted to talk to him, and he came with his sort of seven, nine-year-old, or whatever, and they, and they sat on the sofa and they went to sleep. They were really tired, and, and he spoke, and I was like, there's a, there's a, there's a great man here. You know, he, he, he had this Olympic attitude and that was like, you've got to do it. You've got to keep fighting. You've got to keep. And it really, he really was the embodiment of it's not winning. It's taking part. Of course you want to win. Of course he does. He's an absolute winner in his very fiber and being, but he takes part. He engages with it. And I, and I loved that about him. I loved that about the story 
you'd proven at this point you could rise to any challenge, but then you faced a really unique challenge on Bohemian Rhapsody, coming into direct late into the process. How did you win the authority and the confidence of cast and crew who'd got used to working with a previous director up to that point on the film? Oh, I just ignored everything they said. Yes. <laughs> I, just, yeah, I, just, <laughs> I was like, no, we're going to do it my way now. And, I mean, there was a degree of that. I mean... I, the thing was, after Sunshine and Leith, it went to the Toronto Film Festival. This is the, the brief summary. And it went to the Toronto Film Festival, and Graham King and Dennis O'Sullivan, the producers of Bohemian Rhapsody, came to me and went, we have the Queen musical. Uh, not Queen musical, the Queen biopic. Mm -hmm. So I was like, great. I'm, I'm, so mm -hmm. we started developing that, and I worked with a writer called Joe Pennell, who, who uh, is a friend of mine, playwright. He works on Mindhunter and The Road. He's a great, great writer. And I wanted to create something that was fairly fairly punchy, uh, because I felt, you know, 70s rock star band, you know, it's a bit of tussle there, good bit of drama, that could be really good. Um, and that moved further and further away from maybe what they were thinking, and it was at Sony as a project. And somewhere along the line, that fell apart, as they do, you know, for various reasons. But I'd done a lot of work on the script with Joe, I knew, a, I'd done a lot of research, I knew the guys, I'd met the band. Oh, so you're not coming into it blind at all, you had all this No, yeah. so, so, exactly, so then that went away, and then Eddie the Eagle came up, and I jumped into Eddie the Eagle, and then Fox picks up Bohemian Rhapsody, mm. so I had a relationship with Fox. Mm. And so when they started hitting a bit of a speed bump with, with the production that was uh, two thirds of the way through, mm and it looked like they were losing their director, I got a call and they said, hey, look, um, are you interested in taking over on Bohemian Rhapsody? Because, I mean, I suppose it seemed like the obvious choice. I was attached to it as a director before. I'd done a whole load of work. I knew the material um, and I'd just done Eddie and they were like, we like that film, that's good. He was a safe pair of hands. He was solid, you know. Um, and so I said, yeah, I'm interested. They go, okay, you need to start on Monday. <laughs> and, and I was like, yeah, but it, okay, it's Thursday. They're like, yeah, yeah, but we need you to start Monday. I was like, whoa, that's, that's not a lot of prep by anyone's standard. Um, they said, yeah, look, we've had to shut down production. We need to get going. And I said, okay, well, let me watch it and, th and then I'll, I'll let you know. They said, no, 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 it's a yes or no answer now. So I'm like, wow, okay, they're really up against it. <laughs> How much can I get? Um, <laughs> um, no, that's slightly true, but not completely. Um, so, no, they did. You know, look, it, it was, I, I did. And I was like, this is a, and then Matthew Vaughan went to me, you should go and do it. And I was like, well, you know, Rocket Man. We were in development with Rocket mm. Man. I was, I was working on the script and everybody said, no, you should go and do it. I was like, he goes, because then you can see what they're doing and then we'll know what not to do on Rocket Man. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Matthew Vaughan is a really good producer. Yeah, he didn't fact, get to the top without yeah, being smart. Yeah, exactly, without a little yes. Machiavellian yes. kind of. No, but in the best possible way. And yeah. I was like, yeah. okay, great. So I did, I read the script and then eventually, of course, they let me see it. I said, yes. You know, he said, look, I'll make the time for you to go do this. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll create the space. Do you want to do it? I was like, I do. I want to get on a set. I want to. And, 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 to, and I... And to a degree, I did. I, I, I thought, right, I've got to come in, hit the ground running. I've got to be really authoritarian, which is not generally my way. You know, mm -hmm. as I develop things, I'm like, well, what do you think? Tell me what you think. I, was, oh, I didn't see it like that, but I like it. And um, So for me, it was, it was very useful in terms of learning about, about the craft of directing movies, you know, that, that sometimes you have to just drive and lead from the front and come on, we're going this way, and everyone uh, get behind it. And, and, and that... That production needed that, mm. and I and I really benefited from that. I was just like, because I knew I had to do it, because Fox were like, we're hemorrhaging money, and there's that. And they're all sort of worried, and I was like, right, we're going we're to take care of this. We're going to mm. get it going. We're going to get on set at 8.30 every morning. We're going to be turning over by 9. We're going to, you know, get the days. You know, they were, they were in trouble. I wanted to, mm. I went, and, and I sat with the actors, and I was like, God, these guys have really been, you know, uh, thrown to the walls, really. You know, it's just not... It's not a, a great environment, you know, because there's a there's a legacy there. This music is incredible. There's a band. There's, you know, Freddie and and stuff. There's there's stuff there that should be uh, taken care of. Uh, it's what I learned with Eddie the Eagle. I think I was saying is that when you see there's a real life person involved, mm. when there's real life people involved, there's a responsibility to that. Those people have people who love them and care about them and who it means something to. And Anyway, I, I really enjoyed that. I got it and I was like, come. And, and people responded really well. And 
and we got it over the line, we moved it forward, and, and there was fun to be had, and there was some really good fun. And, and there's a few musical bits in there as well that I got to means test things and, mm. and, and explore. Um, uh, so I had a bit of a sort of workshop playground in a way, mm. you know, and I, I think it was benefiting that production. It was benefiting me, you know, and that, that was healthy. That was good. Mm. All this life experience and career experience that we've talked about today uh, leads you to your current masterpiece, uh, Rocket Man. Um, now, uh, it, it really elevated Can the you biopic. Do all my and from and <laughs> other, <laughs> sorry, I think we've all seen it several times. You know, we love, but sorry. but you know. You, there's so many ways you could do that story, and we've we've seen uh, a lot of times like a lot of rock stars seem to have the same story, you know, yeah. bad parents, uh, addiction, yeah. success, yeah. difficult dealing with fame. But but you bring in these new elements. I think the the time the movie really takes off is during the performance of Crocodile Rock, where Elton's feet sort of leave the ground when he's performing at, yeah. the, at the Troubadour. Yeah. You have uh, other great scenes like sort of Rocket Man being played out sort of like, uh, underwater at a time mm -hmm. of despair. Yeah. How did you come up with these choices to make it so much more than just a standard biopic? Well, there was elements of it in Lee Hall's script that I got mm. that, that I responded to. Um, but I think... Early on in the story of Elton, what I realised I really wanted to do was not create his parents to just be villains, to just be one dimensional kind of, oh, mum was bad, dad was absent. And, and when I sat them around that living room table and I listened to the lyrics of I want love, and I realised that they all could sing a verse of that, and that all that spoke to all of what they were yearning for, and that I could open the audience to what their inner voice is and what their desires are, in a way that meant that I didn't have to write all these big laboured scenes, and I didn't have to sort. Of, you know, the great thing about the musical number is that you can sort of fast forward through, through periods of time, you know, that's like Saturday Night's a Right for a Fight. It sort of spans five years of his of his life as it sort of fast forwards through his youth. Or, or Benny and the Jets, when you sort of fast forward through 10 years of debauchery. You know, that's really what that is speaking to. But also with, with something like I Want Love, it just opens the audience up to know that all these people have got some internal voice that is not just about, oh, I'm nasty, or I don't want to know you. They, they want something and they just, and, and I was like, they're all sitting at the table with people who could potentially give them that, but they're, they're missing it. And the boy leads it, I want love. They all say it. And, and, and I think for me that opened us up to letting those characters be much more nuanced and real and, and, and kind of uh, complex. Taking the songs out and using them as an imaginative tool, as, a, 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 as something that was outside of the story in a way, uh, that, that only needed to answer emotional questions or only needed to speak to where he was at psychologically and, uh, and emotionally, then that meant the drama could do its own thing and the songs just it kind of augmented that or moved us through a period of time. Um, and it just was like, this is a really exciting way to do it. And, and, and the truth is, when we were doing it, I was like, so many times I was like, does this work? I don't even know. It, what, like, people were like, what is it? And then we'd put all the numbers together and be like, oh my God, that's, that's fun to watch. But does it, does it really work as a whole? Because, you know, films come together in, in pieces, as we all know. Um, so, yeah, I, fortunately it does. <laughs> I like to think so anyway. And a big part of its success is Taron Egerton's performance. Taron is rapidly becoming the De Niro to your Scorsese. Um, how does this working partnership work so well? And how have the two of you enjoyed off camera being on this journey together as you take Rocket Man around the world and see what an effect it's had on people? Um. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, no, look. He, I, I'm, I'm much enamored. I love Taron. You know, he 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 absorbs what I say, and 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 he kind of turns it over and comes out with something even more extraordinary than I ever imagined. And I and I go, yeah, that's what I meant. Because uh, he, you know, he he he, you know, it, it's for me, it's about trust. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, and I think I just love him and what he does and how he does it. And I think the audiences do, and he does, and. 
he wants to learn and move forward and do things that completely challenge him. And, and, and he's really ready to be exposed. I think he, he has this great authenticity in how he approaches stuff and what he does and what he puts out there. He, he wants to be real. He wants to be truthful. And, and I think that maybe speaks back to my early years as training as an actor with my improvisational stuff that I mm -hmm. did and, uh, and, and, um, and how, I, how I feel about acting, you know, not to say that I don't appreciate all kinds, but I think we're just similar actors maybe in that way, mm -hmm. uh, although I don't get to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, in just a few short films, you've established yourself as one of our finest directors. Now lots of opportunities must be coming towards you. You've got lots of choice, uh, I would imagine. But how do you see the future direction of your own career? What kind of stories do you want to tell going forward? I'm, I'm kind of open to, to doing more and big things, things that I'm, I just want to get excited about and mm. other people will get excited about. And I don't, I'm very open to seeing what happens next. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, um, we, we, yeah, there's many interesting things. And, mm -hmm. and I always, it's the actor's mentality. It's like, how do I make this work? That's the first thing as the actor that you go to. It's like, how do I make it work? What do, you know, uh, uh, um, and I think that's my approach to film. And, and, and I have to learn as a director to just go, what does work? Why does it work? What doesn't work? Why doesn't it work? Because as an actor, you don't get to pick and choose so much. You know, if you're doing Shakespeare, you can't go, can we rewrite this? <laughs> you know, because it's done and you've got to make that work. Do you know what I mean? And so it's, my, my go-to place is how do I make that work? How do I make that work? And, and there's always a way. It's just whether you're going to invest two years of your life in it or yeah. not. And this has been an insightful and I think inspirational time with Dexter yeah. Fletcher. Yeah.